You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. The idea of reaching financial independence seems impossible for some people. But at a particular point in time, when you realize that it's possible for you, that you've kind of mapped it out for yourself, you start thinking about what does it look like for my kids to do this? And you recognize, wow, there's a chance it won't be as difficult for them as it was for me. Now, the other half of this is that we hear these stories about how basically, you know, it's poverty to wealth to poverty in three generations, right? The lessons are learned or squandered over three generations. But what if they weren't? What if you were constantly building on the knowledge from the prior generation? What if... Instead of trying to figure out what does it look like to reach financial independence, instead, you are really thinking about what does it look like to be a good steward of wealth for the following generations? It's an interesting problem or situation to work through, but for many people in this community, it'll be a reality. And increasingly, as we foster these types of dialogues, we find out about individuals that don't identify necessarily as first generation five or second generation five, but really thinking about it more through the lens of third and fourth generation. How cool would it be to continue to have these types of conversations and see what were the money lessons that were handed down to prevent this coat sleeve to coat sleeve situation in three generations? So today we're speaking with Ann Zanka and she is identifying as really benefiting or really being on this path as a result of the lessons that were passed down from her grandparents. So third generation Phi and has been taking those lessons and trying to pass them on to their kids. You're looking at a situation here where you have consistent money lessons being passed down to each progressive generation. We're at the fourth generation now. That's a reality for her and her family. And there's a lot here because this is not a silver spoon story. This is a situation where her grandparents are working through total poverty. So to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I am doing quite well. And yeah, to your point, this is not just a second generation Phi story, which is what we talk about on, on Choose of Eyes so often, because really for many of us, this is the first time anyone in our extended family has even thought about finances, not less reach financial independence. But in Anne's case, her grandparents reach FI. Now, clearly, before there was ever a concept of this phrase of financial independence, but but they reached it and they passed these lessons on. And now Anne is passing them on to her children. So I'm just fascinated to hear this entire generational story arc. So Anne, with that, welcome to Choose a FI. Thank you. So, and if we go back and we talk your, you know, your money story uh, that you were sharing with us offline really starts with your grandparents. It's interesting and surprising to me how much you actually know about your grandparents' financial picture, where they came from, what they were able to accomplish, and then how much of that was passed along to you. You know, many of us think about getting our money lessons from our parents. You really are attributing a lot of the lifestyle you're living currently and the money lessons you learned to your grandparents. So tell us a little bit more about the origin of that. Right. Absolutely. So as I was telling you earlier, my grandparents were children of the Great Depression when they were teenagers. They lived through it. And obviously, that left some scars on them. They learned some valuable lessons, and they learned how to save money. So that was the first part of their financial independence story. They got married, and they started with nothing. My grandparents used to tell me that when they got married, they didn't have two plug nickels to rub together. But After they started saving money and obviously working very hard, my grandpa was a tool and die man. So he learned his trade and he worked very hard. My grandmother became a stay-at-home mom, as was pretty typical for her generation. They saved, but then after a certain point, there's only so much you can do with savings. They had to really do something else to get to financial independence. And I don't think that that was ever their goal. They just knew that they should save money because they didn't want to relive anything like what they went through when they were children in the Great Depression. So my grandfather's brother, Stanley, actually introduced him to stock investing. 
Can you give I us, can believe. we attach a, a time to this? We're talking about stock investing. You know, a lot of us are looking at stock investing through the modern lens. You know, what era, what time, what, what decade was this? And, and what did that practically look like? So I don't know exactly when he started investing in stocks, but I'm guessing it was around maybe the 1950s. And he just started learning about companies. He was an individual stock investor. I don't know that mutual funds were really a big thing at that point. So he would just pick companies that he liked. He read the Wall Street Journal religiously every day with my grandma. And they would really just invest in companies that they felt were stable. They actually liked dividend stocks. So they would invest in oil and gas companies. They would invest in utilities and they would reinvest the dividends. After years of investing and getting good dividends, reinvesting those dividends, they were able to build a substantial amount of wealth through that process. So, Anne, I'm curious about your your grandpa's self-education, basically. This is obviously 50 years before the internet was ubiquitous. And you said, you know, he's sitting around reading the Wall Street Journal. Did he have any type of formal education in this or was this just purely passion-led learning? Passion-led learning. He taught himself. He would get annual reports from companies and read them. He did not have a college education. Like I said, he was a tool and die man. He went to the Navy and that's how he learned his trade. And then he just kind of brainstormed with his brother and talked about stocks. They shared stock tips. That's incredible. Were they ever entrepreneurial in any sense? Or was this purely, like you said before, hard work and savings, which is a critical aspect of it. And then investing, or was, were there ever any other ways that this manifested itself? I know that they did like to invest in real estate. I don't know a whole lot about what they did with it, but I don't think that that was a big part of their portfolio. It was mostly just the individual stocks. And, and the fact that you're so familiar with what they invested in and, you know, the process that they went through, you know, as a grandchild is very striking to me. Although I could probably identify for you what my grandparents estimated net worth was, you know, long, long past the retirement. Like as an adult, I probably have some sense of what it was or maybe more accurately what it wasn't. I, I couldn't really tell you a whole lot about what they invested in or what my grandfather or grandmother's mindset was with regards to building wealth, or even that they appreciated the importance of, you know, investing in the market. And you are, and I'm just curious, are you hearing about this, you know, second or third hand from your parents or were these money lessons passed down to you directly from your grand? What, what's the interplay there between what you're doing with money and, and what your grandparents did? So essentially you're asking me, how did I learn all these things about how my grandparents invested? Yeah. Were you, were you asking them questions? What are you doing? Was he sharing with you? Did he give you uh, stocks uh, from his poor? Like, just give us a sense for how did this awareness about what they were doing to build wealth? How did you learn all this? So a couple of things. One, my mom would tell me how my grandpa got into stock investing. That's how I learned about his brother and, and how they really got started in this. And she was pretty impressed with his knowledge that he was able to just pick this up and run with it, obviously. But I grew up with it because I was the beneficiary of some of these stock purchases that he made. When I was about, oh, probably 12, maybe 14, my grandparents must have come to the realization that they had more money than they could potentially spend in the rest of their projected life. So they started a program of gifting stocks to their children and their grandchildren. Now they had four children and 11 grandchildren. So when they started gifting stocks, they didn't do large amounts. I don't know if they could have or not. I'm really, I don't know their whole financial situation, but I do know parts of it. And they would give a certain stock every time they gifted, they would give one stock to all of their children. And then they would give some other stock to all of their grandchildren in the same amounts. We're not talking large amounts of money here. When we would get a stock gift, it would usually be like something that was valued at the time at maybe $1,000, maybe $2,000. Certainly a generous gift from a grandparent. And when you multiply that times the number of children and grandchildren they have, they were gifting a substantial amount of money. But for any individual child who was receiving it, it wasn't a large sum. But they would usually give us stocks, like I said, that were either utilities or oil and gas stocks. 
that paid a really decent dividend. And so we were reinvesting. There were these drip programs. And a drip program is dividend reinvestment program. At the time, we didn't have brokerage accounts and we did not have the ability to just click a button and say, yes, reinvest all my dividends. You had to fill out a form and send it into the company saying, yes, I want you to, instead of sending me a check every time there's a dividend payment, I want you to buy more stock in my portfolio. So I just did that. I just reinvested all of my dividends because I didn't want little checks for $2.50 following me wherever I happened to live at the time. And over time, my portfolio grew. I didn't have to sell my stocks, fortunately, to pay for college or to pay for any other expenses. So all of those little dividends invested over time accumulated to a substantial amount of money. Certainly nothing that was going to take me to buy all on its own. But, you know, we always say getting to that first 100,000 is the toughest. And all of this little accumulation of gains got Hmm. me to a point where I had a substantial start to that process. And the other thing that was pretty cool is I was learning about stocks as I was growing up. I would actually get a physical stock certificate when they made a gift to me at the beginning. As we got older, they were gifting it to us in our brokerage accounts because everything transitioned to an electronic format. But I was holding a piece of paper that said, I own five shares of this company. And that was a very tangible experience for me. I could see that I owned something and I knew and I understood what it meant. I was owning a piece of a company. Yeah, that's so cool. And and that definitely mirrors my own growing up when my my aunt Karen was a she was an admin actually for I think she worked at Solomon Smith Barney and Merrill Lynch and just making it part of our normal behavior to own stocks. I remember she got us like one share of Disney and, you know, asked us what our favorite companies were. I think this is dating me back to the uh, the mid to late 80s, but like top baseball cards and Marvel comic books. I think I had a share of each of those. And it's funny because you said those little checks following you around. I, I probably have like 10 uncashed checks of like 62 cents or 27 cents for uh, different dividends that came out, which I'm sure is maddening to the accountants. But uh, wait, but right yeah, was, now as a uh, grown adult, Brad, accountant, Brad, no, five, no, no. Brad with lots of time has 60 cent checks hanging out. No, no, no. Come oh. on. They're, uh, <laughs> they're long gone, but o- over the years, over the years. But and I'm curious about your grandparents, I guess, gifting you appreciated stock. That's an interesting concept. And I'm curious if you have any sense or could pass along to the audience, like how that works as far as taxes go? Like, are there considerations? Like if it's under or over the gift tax limit, is that something you could speak to? Right. Absolutely. So yes, they did gift us in general stocks that were appreciated and that worked for them because they did not have to sell it and pay taxes on the capital gains. It was kind of a win-win. So they didn't have to pay for the accumulation of wealth and we got a gift. It was a gift that came with a tax burden, to be sure, but it was still a gift. And there are a few ways that you can look at this. As a child, and still now, the children have an ability to be able to have a certain amount of capital gains every year tax-free. So what I could have done, and if I was in a position to be gifting to my children right now, what I would do is I would gift them a certain amount, and then they could take up to $2,000 tax-free and just churn it. Let's say if I gifted $2,000 worth of appreciated Amazon stock or something like that, then I could sell that in my child's brokerage account. They could incur the gain and it would be below their taxable limit. So essentially, they would be able to build wealth tax-free. Just to clarify, and, and I think I was caught up, but that's the limit for kids to be like, the, so that the $2,000 is the threshold specifically of gain. So between the basis and the gain, they'd probably be able to sell more than that. So Amazon has had a, you know, a crazy year. And if you're stacking a bunch of those years together, you know, maybe it's doubled over a period of time. So your $2,000 looks a lot like $4,000 now. So you sell $4,000 worth of the stock, 2000 of which is gain. That's what they would be taxed on. But because their effective tax rate is zero up to that first $2,000 gain, then you're saying, hey, tax me. The government's like, no, you're good. They're like, great. Let's do this again next year. Is that is that basically the idea? Yes, absolutely. If you've listened to the show for any period of time, you've heard us talk about the need for a great life insurance policy. 
But a great life insurance policy does not have to be expensive. In fact, some of the most suboptimal plans out there are the most expensive. Keep your investments simple and keep your insurance simple and aligned with your goals. That's why when I needed a term life insurance policy for my family, I chose Policy Genius, and it's why we talk about it so much on this show. Policy Genius compares quotes from the top life insurance companies in one place. It just takes a few minutes to compare quotes from the top insurers to find your best price. This not only saves you a lot of legwork, but you can save up to $1,500 a year or more by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape for free. I can confirm this. Wow, they, they made it a breeze. So if you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they're going to be there to take care of everything. So if you're one of the many people looking to buy life insurance right now, but you're not sure where to start, head to policygenius.com and tell them that Choose FI sent you. Policy Genius will find you the best rate and handle the process completely. They'll get you and your family protected and hopefully give you one less thing to worry about. All right, we have some exciting news. Chooseify Publishing is putting out its latest book. This is entitled Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. And you heard the authors on episode 232. It's Doug Nordman, who is no stranger to the financial independence community, and his daughter, Carol Pittner. And if you have kids, or if you think you might one day have kids, if you have grandkids, if you know kids, this is a fantastic, fantastic book. It's a great gift. These are the tips and tricks and strategies that Doug and his wife used to present the concepts of financial independence to Carol. And it's remarkable to see it from both of their perspectives. That's the coolest part about this book that Doug presents, but Carol talks about how did I receive this and what did I take action on? And we think this is critical for furthering this concept of second generation FI. Every bit of information that we can get out there is just extremely, extremely helpful. And Doug and Carol just knocked it out of the park with this book. So if you're looking to order the book, head to chooseify.com slash next gen. That's N-E-X-T-G-E-N. Chooseify.com slash next gen. No, this is fascinating. And when you look at what your goals are, one of their goals were to help their kids and, and, and do so in multiple ways. One, obviously they're passing some wealth uh, along to the next generation ahead of time, maybe when the kids are in a position to use it the most. By doing this, they're effectively removing the tax barrier that would be there if they were just giving them this massive lump sum all the way at the end of their financial journey. But on top of that, you know, their kids are learning these money lessons, you know, from this idea of wealth is built and lost within three generations. They believe that this is going to have some impact. And clearly that thesis for your family proved out. What was the impact on your parents? I know you said your mom was very impressed by what your grandparents were doing, but it sounded like your parents also achieved financial independence. Do you think it was easier for them because of what they saw your grandparents doing? Oh, yes, definitely. My parents both worked very hard as well. My dad is a retired dentist, so he obviously had a good way to earn a living, but they were following my grandparents' example. In addition to being a dentist, they also built their own office building and became landlords. So they did the real estate by play as well. And they owned their own business. Obviously, my dad was an entrepreneur. He owned his own dental business. And then they together owned their own landlord business with the office building. So they set their own path to buy by doing those things, following the example of my grandparents. Yeah. And what you embedded in there, I think is the part that I really want to want to get across. I think when we're talking about fourth generation fight, it's not even though it might be on paper, it's not necessarily so much that you're fi because you inherited a silver spoon or your parents are fi because, you know, your parents had twice as much as they needed. And, and all that may be true in parallel, but the success story, I think, is the money lessons that are passed down that allowed you to not need it, you know? And so when you're talking about a stewardship of wealth, you know, this money may have a greater purpose and beyond, but the value of the information was it's, it's the money lessons that are being passed down. So your parents, because of what they saw your grandparents doing, you know, they didn't actually go about it the exact same way. They tackled entrepreneurship, but at the core, it's based on the simple equation. You need to spend less than you make. You need to increase your savings. And then, and I, I heard you mention this earlier, but I think it's worth mentioning a little bit more. It's not enough just to 
save money and put it under the mattress. Like tell us a little bit more about that coming through. It's not enough just to work really hard and save money under your mattress. Right. It's not. My grandpa was a tool and die man and that was their only income. So if they only had that, I don't know if they would have ever reached by. They were really good savers, but they had four children and they lived very long lives. They both lived until they were 90 or just about. I don't know that you could potentially save enough to get there and support yourself with just your income from your job. I really think that they needed that investment aspect in order to get themselves there, either through real estate or through what they chose, individual stocks, investing in the market or some other entrepreneurial venture. It doesn't just happen. You have to do something with that money. Yeah. And that certainly makes sense. I mean, clearly sticking your money under the mattress or even into just a generic savings account, even at this point, you know, a, a high yield one. I mean, it's going to get eaten away by inflation. So clearly the money has to be invested. And I think that's a difficult thing for so many of us, right? It sounds like, like your grandfather educated himself greatly to the point where not only was he comfortable, but this was a really active part of his life. As you said, he's read the wall street journal every single day. And, and I'm curious, did he ever sit you down and talk through any of these things that he learned? Did he ever like teach you overtly about investing or was it, and I don't mean to say just, but it was it just giving you those shares? Like were there lessons that you talked about that then you move forward with in your life? Not overtly. I do remember my grandma at one point that she gifted us, they had gifted us shares of an energy stock. And she said, it's got a great dividend. You can spend the dividend, but keep the stock. And that's the only investment advice I ever got from them volunteered. <laughs> but when I got older, when I was married and had children and I would talk to my grandpa who was now, you know, in his upper eighties and still reading the wall street journal every day, we would ask him for stock tips and he would give us stock tips. He would say, Oh, this energy company is doing really well. They're paying a 12% dividend. And then he would give me the downside. He's like, but eventually oil fields run dry. So you have to consider that. So it was not until I was older and, and asking the questions myself that he really stepped in and said, yeah, you know, if, if you want the information, we can have a conversation and we can talk stock tips too. So in the context of, you know, these four generations, when you look at your generations, I, I believe you said there were, there were 11 of you, 11 grandchildren. And I'm curious, especially in particular with your siblings, what did you guys end up doing with these gifts that were given to you to kind of teach you these money lessons? You said your grandmother said, you can spend the dividend, don't touch the stock. So what did that mean for you as you were moving into adulting where you're making your own financial decisions? And maybe you're in a position where you have, you know, where everybody else is maybe starting to take on debt or has a $0 net worth. You're not at five, but maybe you have a net worth of 20, 30, hundred thousand dollars, somewhere in that range. Like what did you and your siblings end up doing with that money? So my net worth wasn't nearly that high, but maybe in the $20,000 range when I was ready to head into college. And fortunately, my parents had taken my earnings and in my stocks that my grandpa and grandma had gifted to us, and they had continued to invest for us, which really helped me graduate from college debt free, which is one of the hugest gifts I have ever received. Mm. And if there was one thing that I could give to my children, it would be that gift. I know that we have a lot of debates in the FI community about the value of going to college these days, but if my kids do end up going to college, I want them to be able to have that gift as well. Graduate from college debt free. Yeah, I think that is a fantastic gift. I mean, I think that kind of gets to the heart of it. It, it. A lot of we're having to make these value proposition and evaluate, you know, is college worth it? Because college for the vast majority of people is coming with a sixty to hundred thousand dollar student loan price tag. And what we're seeing is that kids are losing a decade plus of their lives because that isn't on the table. I mean, I think that is really what is driving this entire conversation about the value of college is because that's in the backdrop. Colleges have brought in over $1.5 trillion in tuition fees over the last, I don't know, decade or so. And, and what did those students get for that if their next decade plus of their life is dealing with $100,000 of student loan debt? But if the college is free, then it's, you know, or not free, but if the college is covered, the cost of college is covered, then the ROI is definitely there. 
Right. Absolutely. And the stock investing my parents did for us was a big part of being able to send us to college. College was less expensive than it is now, but it was still a huge part of me being able to graduate without that student loan debt. And I believe that my brothers did end up selling some or all of their gifted stocks during that time to help them pay for their schooling and graduate. They both graduated from medical school. And I don't know if they graduated completely without debt, but it certainly helped out to have that money available. So your siblings had minimal student loan debt, if any, and you guys are starting this next chapter, not having to deal with that, that potentially lost decade that I was just describing for you in your own path now as an adult responsible for your own decisions, starting a family, kids, where did you go from there? I mean, you know, you're, you're, you love the FI community. You're a huge part of the FI community. When did financial independence become a goal for you? I didn't know it was financial independence. So when I found you guys, I was so excited because I felt like I'd found my tribe. Like many other people have described on your podcast, it just all made sense to me when I found that goal. But I always knew that I was saving and trying to build wealth. I ended up turning that gift from my grandparents into a, a good start for my path to buy. I hit a road bump, as many people do in their lives. Life is, just doesn't end up being a straight path. It ends up having pitfalls. And a few years ago, I ended up getting a divorce, which was my decision. I knew that it was going to have pretty big financial consequences for me, and it did. My ex-husband was allowed by the courts to take half of everything that my grandparents had gifted me, and he did. That was devastating. But looking back on it now, I don't think that it hurt me in the long run. Hmm. I look back on it now and I think part of me says it's just money. And part of me says I'm doing really well and it doesn't matter. So part of my journey to financial independence was not only did I have my grandparents' money, but we had done a good job of saving money ourselves and building our own financial nest egg. So if that's all I had when I was divorced, I would have been in a lot of trouble. But since I had all of these lessons from my grandparents and I had been saving and I had been being conservative with my money, I was okay. And I could make that decision to move on with my life in the direction that I knew it needed to go without being tied to that decision that ended up not being a good one. I didn't have to consider the financial consequences of it when I moved on. It was painful, but it's over and now I can move on and I don't have to worry about the fact that it cost me something. That is incredible. Anne. And, and that's what we always say here, right? Is that FI, it gives you options, right? You had an entire adult life of, of saving. You had all these lessons from your grandparents and your parents, and it enabled you to have this mindset to move forward from something that can and probably was on, on many levels devastating, right? But to your point, life is bumpy and you're going to face significant obstacles and it's, it's how you approach them mentally. And it certainly sounds like you have, have moved on in the best possible way. And, and I'm curious, like, what does it look like financially on the other side of that divorce? Like what happens right after there? How do you move forward now as a, a newly single woman with, with children as well. So there have been a lot of things that have happened in the courts that I felt have just been tacitly unfair, but I am powerless to change them. So I don't worry about it. I only worry, try to only worry about the things that I can change. And that's not one of them. So I have to say to myself again, it's just money and it's fine. It's going to be over when my children are both 18, I won't have to worry about any of the implications of the divorce anymore. And I can just move forward. And like I said, looking back on it, if I try to imagine how this has hurt me, I can't put my finger on it. I'm okay. I'm fine. And I'm still going to reach by. So at the end of the day, I don't know what I'm worried about. Can we slow down on that for just a second? Because I think what you're saying is maybe the opposite of what someone else in our audience is feeling right now in that maybe they've been listening to the show for a period of time and they're like, you know, well, this show would be great 
if I weren't going through a divorce or, you know, no one that's hosting the show has had a divorce. And so they can't really identify with my life, my struggles, my situation, what I'm dealing with. And I may, I did so much right, but this was out of my control. And now my hopes, my dreams for financial independence, they're gone. I've just had to let it all go. It was a, it was a, you know, it's, it's not, it's not there anymore. And I just kind of framed it that way for that individual. So maybe they will just give this episode a listen. And, and I'm just hoping that because of how you've come through this and what you're actually doing, like, what would you actually want to tell them? Like, is there anything, you know, practical that they can do financial that they can do emotional, you know, from, from any of these different levels, is there any advice that you can give them? Cause I agree with you. You're going to reach financial independence. This isn't going to stop you. And I believe that, but this other person doesn't believe it for themselves. Like, how do you bridge that gap? What, what advice would you give them? Right. So there are going to be things that are burdening you and you just work with them. Follow your heart. Don't sacrifice your life. Don't sacrifice your happiness and don't sacrifice the person that you want to be because you made a bad decision. It's okay. You can work hard. You can invest. As long as you are not at the very end of your life, there's still lots of opportunity for you to save money and meet your goals and find love if that's what you're looking for. You can do any of these things. Once you get to the other side, it's dark in the middle. I'm not going to lie. There were a lot of bad days. And there were a lot of days when I was worried about money. But sometimes our fear of what we're going to lose is irrational. We don't know what's going to happen on the other side. But we do know that as long as we keep investing, the stock market goes up more than it goes down. And there are these things that we can always rely on. As long as we keep doing those things that get us into a stronger financial position, eventually it's going to be okay, even if it's not right now. Let's really dial in on this. Let's let's assume that there's someone listening to this and they just like, it's just too much. You know, you kind of have the ostrich, you just want to stick your head in the sand and, and wait till it's over. And you just have this sinking feeling that it's never going to be over. What did you do to pull yourself back from the brink? Like practically step-by-step, step, what did you actually do? So when I got divorced, I had just gotten my yoga teacher certification and I was teaching yoga. That was my job. I was a yoga teacher and I was a stay-at-home mom. I hadn't practiced accounting for 13 years, but I was given a year by the court to get myself together and get back into the workforce. So I did it. I got my CPA certification renewed and I found a job. I went back into the workforce and that helped a lot. I was able to save in a 401k. I was able to have somebody else help me pay for medical insurance. And I was able to start saving again. And I was able to get a mortgage, which was helpful. Yeah. And I'm curious. So, you know, getting back into this accountant's career, you're renewing your CPA license. There are a lot of stay-at-home spouses who have gone through a similar situation where for, for many reasons, right? They need to go back to work. And it's been years out of the workforce. And I, I wonder what type of advice you'd have for that person who's, who's thinking about going back, who's nervous about going back, who's wondering, do they still have the skills? What is it like, you know, nowadays, like so many years later? I'd love to hear your thoughts on like, what was going through your mind when, when you're first going back? And what would you tell that person? Do it scared. Someone who's very, very wise told me this when I was talking about getting a divorce and when I was talking about going into the back into the workforce, she just said, do it scared. You just have to do it. The first year is going to stink. It's going to be really hard. But the first year ends and you get the skills back and you catch up and then it's better on the other side. You can do this. You can do hard things. You know, as you do start to rebuild... Uh, and thankfully not completely from scratch, but you're, you know, you're making forward progress again. You're identifying financial independence as a goal for yourself that's attainable. And you're thinking, all right, I'm not going to be able to do exactly for my kids what my grandparents were able to do for me, but I can do a version of that. And I can certainly pass along these money lessons. What does your version of that look like? What conversations are you having with them? And what version of the experience that you had are you able to provide to your kids at this point? So I was very fortunate that my grandparents lived long enough to continue this gifting process to the point where they were able to gift a small amount anyway to their great grandchildren wow. as well. So my grandparents were actually able to give small amounts of stock to both of my children. So they had that to get them started. And then 
we began a program of investing for them. And with their pocket change, my, my children are now older, they're, they're high school age and college age. When we got to this point a couple of years ago, I wanted them to feel comfortable investing in individual stocks and mutual funds if that's what they wanted. We listened to the Choose FI podcast together and they said they wanted more control over their money. So I established a stash account for each of them. We put in a small amount, a couple hundred dollars from their Christmas money or their birthday money. And I gave them the password and said, invest your money, choose some stocks. It's okay if you make a mistake. It's not a lot of money and you have a long time frame to make it back or to make it grow or to make a different decision. You're not going to need this money for a while. So experiment, fall down, lose money. It's okay. Have they lost money? <laughs> Actually, no. I think that they both had some gains with the bull market that we've been in over the past year. Nice. Very, <laughs> they did very cool. really well. And, and my son cashed it out to buy himself something. So, Oh, okay. It worked for him. And I'm curious, how do you impart the FI mindset to your children? I think really the hallmark of the FI mindset is, is long-term, right? So how does this transcend just like particular investing? Like, do you have ways of talking to them about this being a 30, 50, 80 year for them, you know, based on their age, probably 60 to 80 year time frame? Like, has that come across yet or are they not at the point where that type of conversation is, is applicable? No, we talk about it. And we talk about buying used cars. They see the example of me driving a used car. My last car I drove for 10 years until it just became too expensive to maintain it anymore. And I bought a used car and now going to continue to drive that until it's not drivable anymore. Both of them got used cars for their first car and they're responsible for paying for it. They have to pay for the car, insurance, the gas, so they are going to need to take some financial responsibility there. If they get good grades, they get a discount on the car insurance. So they're incented to get good grades. And they have their own stock accounts, of course. When I'm ready to invest money for them, I say, this is what I'm thinking about buying for you. Is that okay with you? And they say yes, or they say no. Or I say, well, these are the things that I'm looking at. Which one do you like? And they tell me what they prefer that I invest in for them. So they do have some say over their investment portfolio and what they want to do with their money, even though they're still custodial accounts. I make all of the decisions and have all of the control. This is exciting. It's so much fun to be able to have these conversations. I'm genuinely envious of being able to really start having more conversations about money with my son outside of don't swallow that. Take that out of your mouth. Don't swallow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm you know, in the context of four generations pursuing financial independence and having kind of this mindset, what does financial independence and the pursuit of financial independence, what does that, what does that mean to you? Oh, freedom. It's total freedom. It's not having to do or be bound to anything that you don't want to be bound to. It's not having to be bound to a relationship that's not working for you or an employer that's not working for you or a job that or career that's not working for you. And being able to make your decisions independent of the burden of the financial impact. I love that, Anne. You're, you're speaking to my soul right now. And people are listening to this, people from all walks of life, uh, people that are going through divorce, people that have gone through divorce, people that know someone that's experienced that, and also people that are just love this idea, are captivated by this idea of building lasting wealth for their families. And maybe more than a, the idea of handing out a silver spoon, passing down those money lessons so each generation is benefiting from the prior generation. Uh, I, I say all that to say, if someone's listening to this and they want to follow up with you, they want to connect with you, what is the best way for them to do that? So I am on Facebook. I am Ann Zonka on Facebook. So Ann Zonka on Facebook. And are you in the Facebook group? I am the main group and also in the Richmond group. Fantastic. All right, Ann, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. This has been a blast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm so excited that Ann came on the show and shared this perspective with us. As I mentioned, the idea of being able for my son and daughter to build on the lessons that I have learned and took me so long to learn, Brad, I mean, this is, this is the game right here. I mean, and I mean that in the best possible way, this is the ultimate game. This is life. 
how cool is it to see the next generation pick up that torch? Yeah, it's remarkable. And in this case, it's three next generations picking up the torch, right? That's the wild thing. And you can pass these lessons on. It's a mindset thing. It's not about, like you said, it's not about the silver spoon. It's not about, oh, my grandparents gave me hundreds of thousands of dollars and I'm set. It's about the mindset, right? It's always been for generations, going back to the Great Depression with them, hard work and savings, and then intelligent investing. Mm. And that is a recipe for success. And, you know, I think it's actually going to be even easier for our generation and beyond because we have this common language. I mean, people were doing this sporadically, but they weren't using the same language, right? Like for us, think about the power of knowing, like Anne saying, I found my tribe. I understand this information that was being passed down and I have a language to consistently communicate that. Of course it happened before we had this common language, this common framework, but you know how much easier it is when you do? That's the part that's really cool. So to our audience, if you're listening to this, you're excited about the idea, maybe this is the first episode you've listened to, but you're like, you know what? I think that the idea of pursuing financial independence sounds worth it. Well, you would be right. That's a great analysis. But if you're getting started, go to our website, go to choosefine.com slash start. We've put all of our resources there for you to get you started on your own path to financial independence today. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.